Chapter Ten of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Evening in Church. Alex was huddled on her bed in a rug. She had taken two aspirin tablets because her head ached, and really one is enough. She felt cold and low. She was occupied in not thinking about Paul or the war. It was rather a difficult operation, and took her whole energies. Paul was insistent. She pressed her hands against her eyes, and saw him on the darkness, her little brother, white-faced, with the nervous smile she knew. Paul in a trench, among the wounded and killed, seeing things, hearing things, taken suddenly sick, unable to leave off, putting his head above the parapet, trying to get hit, called sharply to order by superiors. Paul desperate, at the end of his tether, in the night full of flashes and smashes and laughter and grumbling and curses. Paul laughing too and talking, as she and Paul always did when they were hiding things. Paul in his dugout, alone. Unseen, he supposed, with only one thought, to get out of it somehow. The shot, the pain, like flame. The men approaching, who knew. Paul's face, knowing they knew. White, frightened, staring, pain swallowed up in shame. The end. How soon? Ingram hadn't said that. Anyhow, the end. And Paul, out of it at last, slipping into the dark alone. A noble end, Mrs. Frampton had said, not a wasted life. Anyhow, all over for Paul, as Terry had said. And then what? Ingram hadn't said that either, nor had Terry. No one could say, for no one knew. What if anything did come then? Darkness, nothingness, or something new? He has begun to live now, dear, for ever and ever, Kate had said. World without end, amen, Mrs. Frampton had rounded it off. World without end. What a thought. Poor Paul, finding a desperate way out from the world, slipping away into another which had no way out at all. But Mrs. Frampton's and Kate's world without end was a happy, jolly one, presumably, and the more of it the better. It would give Paul space for the life he hadn't lived here. Oh, could that be so? Was it possible, or was it, as so many people thought, only a dream? Who could know? No one, till they came to try, and then perhaps they would know nothing at all either way, not being there any more. Yet people thought they knew, even here and now. Nicky's friend Mr West... He presumably thought he knew. Anyhow, if not going so far as that, he had taken a hypothesis and was, so to speak, acting, thinking and talking on it. He was clever too. Mrs. Frampton and Kate thought they knew too, but they weren't clever. They believed in God, but Alex could have no use for the violet God. Mrs. Frampton's God was the Almighty an omnipotent being who governed all things in gross and in detail, including the weather, although the connection here was mysteriously vague, a god of crops and sun and rain who spoke in the thunder, a truly pagan god, though Mrs. Frampton would not have cared for the word, of chastisements and arbitrary mercies, who was capable of wrecking ships and causing wars in order to punish and improve people the god of the act of god in the shipping regulations a god who could and would unless for wise purposes he chose otherwise keep men and women physically safe protect them from battle murder and sudden death an anthropomorphic god in the semblance for some strange reason known only to the human race of a man a god who somehow was responsible for the war a god who ordered men's estates so that there should be a wholesome economic inequality among them. Such was Mrs. Frampton's god, 
in no material way altered from the conception of the primitive Jews or the modern South Sea Islanders who make God in their image. He had no attractions for Alex, who could not feel that a god of weather was in any way concerned with the soul of the world. Kate's god, on the other hand, was for Alex enshrined in the little books of devotion that Kate had lent her sometimes, and all of which she found revolting, even on the hypothesis that you believed that sort of thing. They propounded ingenuous personal questions for the reader to ask himself, such as, Have I eaten or drunk too much? Have I used bad words? Have I read bad books? As if, thought Alex, anyone would read a bad book on purpose, life being so much too short to get through the good ones, unless one had the misfortune to be a reviewer like Nicky, or to have bad taste like many others, and then wasn't it rather a misfortune than a fault? Have I been unkind to animals, the inquiries went on? Have I obeyed those set over me? Have I kept a guard of my eyes? A mysterious phrase, unexplained by any footnote, and leaving it an open question whether to have done so or to have omitted to do so would have been the sin. Alex inclined to the former view. It somehow sounded an unpleasant thing to do. These books adopted a tone too intimate and ejaculatory for Alex's taste, and they were, it must be admitted, about all she knew of Kate's God, and her distaste for him merely meant that she disliked some of Kate's methods of approach. Alex felt vaguely that West's God was different. There was no softness about him, or about West's approach to him, no sentimental sweetness, no dull piety, but energy, effort, adventure, revolt, life taken at a rush. Dynamite, West had said, to blow up the world. Poetry, too. Harsh and grim poetry, often, but the real thing. Kate's religion might be sung in hymns by Faber, Mrs. Frampton's in hymns by Dr. Watts. West's had very little to do with any hymns sung in churches and it was West's religion which thought it was going to break up the world in pieces and build it anew. Certainly neither Mrs. Frampton's nor Kate's would be up to the task. They would not even want it. Mrs. Frampton worshipped a god of things as they are, who has already done all things well, and Kate, one who is little concerned with the ordering of the world at all, but only with individual souls. One would like to know more about West's God. You should go to church, West had told her. You'd find it interesting. She might find it so, of course. Anyhow, she could try. Paul was driving her to find things out. His desperation and pain, her own, all the world's, must somehow break away through, out and beyond, fling open a gate onto new worlds. Anyhow, it might take one's mind off, help one not to think. It occurred to Alex that she would go to church this evening. It seemed at the moment the simplest way of watching these odd mystical forces, if there were any such forces at work. She would be able thus to see them concentrated, working through a few people gathered together for the purpose. Alex's acquaintance with Sunday evening services, it may be observed, was rudimentary. Two. Meanwhile there was tea. Alex went down to it. There were Mrs. Frampton, Kate, a Mrs. Buller from Anzac next door, and a toasted bun. Mrs. Frampton said to Alex, You do look low, dear. I'm sure it's a good thing you came home. Biliousness isn't a thing to play with. Suppose you were to go to bed straight away and let Kate bring you up a nice hot cup of tea there. Kate said playfully, This is what Sunday outings lead to. They were both at a great distance, as if Alex were at the bottom of the sea. So was Mrs. Buller, who talked to Mrs. Frampton about girls. Girls are, of course, an inexhaustible and fruitful topic. There are so many of them coming and going, and nearly all so bad. Mrs. Frampton and Mrs. Buller and Kate all found them interesting, if a nuisance. Alex found them a safe subject. Mrs. Buller was saying, "'And one thing I have made up my mind, Mrs. Frampton, 
Never again will I have a GFS girl in my house. Besides all the meetings and things at all hours, to have the girls associate coming into my kitchen and talking about prayer, it was prayer for I overheard, and ending up with a kiss you could hear upstairs. It was more than I could be expected to stand. And the girls smashed three cups that same afternoon and answered me back in a downright impertinent way. So I said, if that's what your GFS teaches you for manners, the sooner you and I part company the better. And I gave her her month. I'm sure you were right, said Mrs. Frampton, though of course one mustn't put it all on the GFS. She said this because of Kate, who was a church worker. But as it happened, Kate did not care for the GFS, having fallen out with the local secretary, and also having been told by her vicar that it was a society which drew too rigid an ethical line, and no denominational line at all. Kate also drew rigid ethical lines, when left to herself and her own natural respectability. The comic spirit must be largely responsible for driving people like Kate into the Christian church, a body which, whatever opprobrium it may have at various times incurred, has never yet been justly accused of respectability. So Kate joined in about girls and the GFS. Mrs. Buller said, However, we may be thankful we aren't in the country, for my sister at Stortford has had five soldiers billeted on her, and how is her girl to keep her head among them all? She won't, of course. Girls in a uniform? It goes to their heads like drink. It does seem an upset for your sister, said Mrs. Frampton. And Bertie's started again, wanting to enlist continued their visitor, who had many troubles. If I've told him once, I've told him fifty times. Not while I live, you don't, Bertie. So I hope he'll settle down again. But he says he'll only be fetched later if he doesn't. Such rubbish. He actually wants to go as a common soldier, not even a commission. Think of the class of company he'd be thrown into, not to speak of the risk. Fancy his thinking his father and I could let him do such a thing. Mrs. Frampton made sympathetic sounds. They had tea. They went on talking of Belgians, Zeppelins, bulbs and girls. Belgians as a curiosity, in the corner house. Zeppelins as murder, to call that war, you know. Bulbs as a duty, to be put in quite soon. And girls as a nuisance, to be changed as speedily as may be. Mrs. Buller stayed till nearly six. "'It's always a treat to see Mrs. Buller,' said Mrs. Frampton. "'But fancy, it's nearly time to get ready for church.' Mrs. Frampton's church was at half-past six. Kate's was at seven. It was to Kate's that Alex wanted to go. She did not think that Kate's church would be much use, but she was sure that Mrs. Frampton's wouldn't. Mrs. Frampton's was florid gothic outside, with a mellifluous peal of bells. Kate's was of plain brick, with a single tinny bell. Mrs. Frampton's looked comfortable. Kate's did not. The road into another world, if there was another world, surely would not be a comfortable one. 3. Kate was pleased when Alex said she was coming. She thought the little books had borne fruit. "'It'll be something to do,' said Alex cautiously. "'I hope Mr. Allison will preach.' Kate said. He's so helpful always. Alex wondered if Mr. Allison knew about another world and if he would tell in his sermon. If he did not, he would not be helpful to her. Probably not even if he did. They went diagonally across the little common to the unpretentious brick church whose bell tinkled austerely. It was an austere church both within and without and had a sacrificial beauty of outline and of ritual that did not belong to Mrs. Frampton's church, which was full of cheery comfort and best hats and hymns A and M. Kate's church had an oblative air of giving up. It gave up succulent, completed tunes for the restrained rhythms of plain song, which, never completed, suggest an infinite going on. It gave up comfortable pews for chairs which slid when you knelt against them. Its priests and congregation gave up food before mass and meat on fast days. The chief luxury it seemed to allow itself was incense, of which Alex disliked the smell. 
certainly the air of cheery everyday respectability which characterises some churches was conspicuously absent this church seemed to be perpetually approaching a mystery trying to penetrate it laying aside impedimenta in the quest the quest for what that seemed to be the question the candles on the far altar quivered and shone like stars they sang hymns out of little green books they began by singing in procession a long hymn about gardens and gallant walks and pleasant flowers and spiders webs and dampish mists and the flood of life flowing through the streets with silver sound and many other pleasant things alex glanced at kate curiously kate prim and proper so essentially a violette seemed in herself to have no point of contact with such strange delightful songs such riot of attractive fancy for this was poetry and kate and poetry were incongruous poetry having found the word alex felt it pervade and explain the whole service the tuneless chants the dim glooms and twinkling lights the austerity kate interpreted this poetry for her own needs through the medium of little books of devotion for which prose was far too honourable a word jargon rather pious mushy abominable it was odd kate seemed to be caught in the toils of some strange surprising force alex hadn't learnt yet that it is a force nowhere more surprising than in the unlikely people it does catch the further question may then arise how is it going to use them can it use them at all or does the turning of its wheels turn them out and get rid of them or does it retain them unused it is certainly all very odd this essentially romantic and adventurous and mystical force seems to have a special hold on many timid unromantic and unimaginative persons this essentially corporate and catholic body lays its grasp as often as not on extreme individualists perhaps it is the unconscious need in them of the very thing they have not got that makes the contact perhaps it reveals poetry and adventure to those who could find them in no other guise perhaps it links together in a body those who must otherwise creep through life unlinked gives awareness of the community to the otherwise unaware perhaps on the other hand it doesn't the powers in human beings of evading influences and escaping obvious inferences is unlimited the lights were suddenly dimmer someone got into the pulpit and preached he preached on a question who will lead me into the strong city a very pertinent inquiry alex thought and just what she wanted to know who would who could was there a strong city at all or only chaos and drifting ways of terror and unrest if so where was it and how to get there the strong city said the preacher is the city of refuge for which we all crave and more especially just now in this day of tribulation the kings of the earth are gathered and gone by together but the hill of zion is a fair place and the joy of the whole earth upon the north side lieth the city of the great king god is well known in her palaces as a sure refuge above the noise of battle above the great water floods is the city of god that lieth four square unshaken by the tempests jolly thought alex and just where one would be but how to get into it one had tried ever since the war began to shut oneself away unshaken and undisturbed by the tempests one had come to violette because it seemed more unshaken than would end but violette wasn't really somehow a strong city the tempest rocked one till one felt sick where was this strong city any strong city well all about everywhere anywhere said the preacher one could hardly miss it tis only your estranged faces that miss the many splendid thing and he quoted quite a lot of that poem then he went on to a special road of approach quoting instead i went into the sanctuary of god church alex presumed well here she was 
No, it transpired that it wasn't evening service he meant. He went on to talk of the mass. That, apparently, was the strong city. Well, it might be if one was of that way of thinking, but if one wasn't. Did Kate find it so? And was that why she went out early several mornings in the week? And what sort of strength had that city? Was it merely a refuge, well bulwarked, where one might hide from fear? Or had it strength to conquer the chaos? West would say it had, that its work was to launch forces over the world like shells, to shatter the old materialism, the old comfortable selfishness, the old snobberies, cruelties, rivalries, cant, blind stupidities, lies. The old ways, thought Alex, which were the same ways carried further, West would say, of destruction and unhappiness and strife that had led to the bitter hell where boys went out in anguish into the dark. The city wasn't yet strong enough, apparently, to do that. Would it be one day? "'I will not cease from mental fight,' cried the preacher, who was fond, it seemed, of quoting poetry, "'nor let my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. The next moment he was talking of another road of approach to the city on the hill, besides going to church, besides building Jerusalem in England, a road steep and sharp and black, we take it unawares, forced along it, many boys are taking it this moment, devoted and unafraid, unafraid, thought Alex, and suddenly we are at the city gates, they open and close behind us, and we are in the strong city, the drifting chaos of our lives behind us, to be redeemed by firm walking on whatever new roads may be shown us. God, who held us through all the drifting, unsteady paths, has led us now right out of them into a sure refuge. How do you know? thought Alex. Beyond the steep dark road there may be chaos still, endless, worse chaos, or, surely more natural to suppose, there may be nothing. How did people think they knew, or didn't they? Did they only guess, and say what they thought was attractive? Did Kate know, and Mrs. Frampton? How could they know, people like that? How could it be part of their equipment of knowledge, anything so extraordinary, so wild, so unlike their usual range as that? They knew about recipes, and servants, and dusting, and things like that but surely not about weird and wonderful things that they couldn't see. Alex could rather better believe that this preacher knew, though he did sometimes use words she didn't like, such as tribulation and grace. It would seem that preachers sometimes must. It is impossible and not right to judge them. When the sermon ended abruptly and they sang a hymn of Bunyan's about a pilgrim, 402 in the green books, one was left with a queer feeling that the church had its hand on a door and at any moment might turn a handle and lead the way through. Alex caught for a moment the forces at work. Perhaps West was right about them and they were adequate for the job of blowing up the debris of the world. If only the church could collect them, focus them, use them. Kate and church people of Kate's calibre was surely like untaught children playing, ignorantly and placidly, with dynamite. They would be blown up if they weren't careful. They kept summoning forces to their aid, which must surely, if they fully came, shatter and break to bits most of the things they clung to as necessary comforts and conveniences. But perhaps people knew this, and therefore prayed cautiously, with reservations, so the powers came in the same muffled, rapid way, with reservations. Such were Alex's speculations as the music ended and the congregation filed down the church and shook hands with the tired vicar at the door and went out into the dark evening. The fog came round them and choked the light that streamed from the church and made Alex cough. They hurried home through the blurred, gas-lit roads, "'Did you enjoy the service?' asked Kate. "'I think so,' said Alex, wondering whether she had. "'It's queer,' she added, meaning the position of the Christian church in this world. "'But Kate said, "'Queer?' 
"'Whatever do you mean? "'It was just like the ordinary, like it always is. "'I wish Mr. Allison had preached, though. "'I never feel Mr. Daintry has the same touch. "'He preaches about things and people in general, "'and that's never so inspiring. "'He doesn't seem to get home the same way to each one. "'Now Mr. Allison this morning was beautiful. "'Mr. Daintry, I always think, has almost too many ideas, "'and they run away with him a little. "'However,' Kate's principal, one of them, was not to criticise the clergy. So she stopped. "'I wonder if Florence is in yet,' she said instead, "'and if she's left the larder open as usual, "'and let that kitten get at the chicken. "'I shouldn't be a bit surprised. "'She is a girl.' Alex felt another incongruity. If Kate really believed the extraordinary things she professed to believe about the interfusion of two worlds, at least two, how then did it matter so much about chickens and kittens and Florence? Yet why not? Why shouldn't it give all things an intenser, more vivid reality, a deeper significance? Perhaps it did, thought Alex, renouncing the problem of the Catholic Church and its so complicated effects. "'You've got your cough worse,' said Kate, fitting the key into Violette's latch. "'You'd better go to bed straight, I think, and have a mustard leaf on after supper.' "'You're the colour of a ghost, child. "'Eve is back, I can hear.' "'So could Alex. "'I shall go to bed,' she said. "'I don't want supper.' "'While she was undressing, Evie came in to wash her hands for supper. "'Evie was radiant and merry. "'Hard luck you're having to go back, Al,' said Evie, "'splashing her face and hands. "'I'm stiff all over. "'I'm for a hot bath afterwards. "'We had a lovely time. "'Simply screaming it was.' "'Mr. Doy is rather a sport. "'They're all a jolly set, though. "'Even that Mr. Ingram, the one you were talking to, "'brightened up later on, "'though when first you turned back "'he looks as if he was at his father's funeral. "'You must have made an impression. "'But he got over it all right and was quite chirpy. "'Was he?' said Alex. "'I promised Mr. Doy to go out again with him next sat. "'He's quite determined. "'I don't know what Sid Vinny'll say, "'because I'd half promised him. "'But I don't care.' "'Sid's an old silly, anyhow.' "'Evie smothered herself in the towel, "'scrubbing her smooth skin that no scrubbing could hurt. "'Dommage, you being seedy,' said Evie, "'and pulled off her walking shoes. "'You'd have enjoyed the day no end. "'Still feeling sick? "'Oh, poor kid, bad luck. "'Well, there's the bell, I must run. "'I've heaps more to tell you, "'but you'd better go off straight to sleep after supper.' I won't disturb you when I come up. She ran downstairs. Alex heard her voice in the dining room below through supper. Evie had had a good day. Evie was lovely and jolly and kind and a good sort. But Alex did not want to see her or to hear her talk. 4. It was Kate who came up after supper with a mustard leaf which she put on Alex's chest. "'Shall I read to you till I take it off?' Kate said, and what she selected to read was the current issue of The Sign, the parish magazine she took in. Mrs. Frampton took The Peep of Day, which was the magazine of the church she attended. The mustard leaf, an ancient and mild one, which needed keeping on for some time, allowed of reading The Sign almost straight through, apart from the parish news on the outer pages, which, though absorbing, is local and ephemeral, and should not be treated as literature. Kate began with an article on the organs in our churches, worked on through a serial called Account Rendered, a poem on the women of the empire, a page on waifs and strays, a few words to parents and teachers on the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, thoughts to rest upon, keeping well, some facts for our families, The Pitmans Are Men, a short story, Wholesome Food for Baby, and so at last to our query corner, wherein the disturbed in mind were answered when they had, during the month, written to inquire, Why does my clergyman worship a cross? Is not this against the second commandment? What amusements, if any, may be allowed on Sunday? If I take the communion, should I go to dancing classes? How can I turn from low church to high church? Should not church wardens be Christians? And about many other perplexing problems. 
The answers were intelligent and full. Never a bald yes or no, or we do not know. They often included a recommendation to the inquirer to try and look at the matter from a wider or higher standpoint, and, usually, to read the little book by an eminent canon that bore more particularly on his case. Alex got it all, from the organs in our churches to the Christian church wardens, mixed up with the mustard leaf, so that it seemed a painful magazine, but, one hoped, profitable. She looked at Kate's small prim head in the shadow under the gas, and thought how Kate had been through love and loss and jealousy, and still survived. But Kate's love and loss and jealousy could not be so bad. It was like someone else's toothache. "'We do not quite understand your question,' read Kate. This was on turning from low to high. "'You should try to detach yourself from these party names, which are often mischievous. "'We think you might be helped by the following books. Twenty-five minutes. "'I should think that must be enough, even for that old leaf. "'Does it smart much?' "'Dreadfully,' said Alex, who was tired of it. "'Well, two minutes more,' said Kate, "'and went on to the church wardens, "'who it seemed should be Christians, if possible. "'Now, then,' said Kate, advancing with cotton wool. "'Oh,' said Alex, "'it's been on too long, Kate.' "'You do make a fuss,' said Kate, "'padding her chest with cotton wool "'and tucking the clothes round her. "'Now you go off to Sleepy Town quick.' "'Alex thought how kind Kate was. "'When one had any physical ailment, "'Violette came out strong. "'It was soft-hearted. "'Women are.' Five. When Kate had gone, Alex lay with her eyes tight shut and her head throbbing and tried to go to sleep, so that she need no longer make her brain ache with keeping things out. But she could not go to sleep, and she could not in the silence and dark keep things out, not Paul, nor the war, nor Basil, nor Evie. At last Evie came. Alex, feigning sleep, lay with tight shut eyes face to the wall every movement of evie undressing in her frightful loveliness was horribly clear alex was afraid evie in passing her bed would brush against her and that she would have to scream if only evie would get to bed and to sleep evie after her undressing and washing knelt in prayer for thirty seconds what was evie's god who should say? One cannot tell with people like Evie, or see into their minds. Then took her loveliness to bed, and fell sweetly asleep. Alex knew from her breathing that she slept. Then she unclenched her hands, and relaxed her body, and cried. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Non-Combatants and Others》by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Alex and Evie. Basil had Evie on the brain. He liked her enormously. He was glad he had a month's more leave. He took to meeting her after she came out from her hat shop and seeing her home. They spent Saturday afternoons together. Alex saw them parting one Saturday evening as she came home. Spring Hill was dim and quiet, and they stood by the door into the park on the opposite side of the road to Violette, chaffing and saying good-bye. Alex saw Basil suddenly kiss Evie. It might be the first time. In that case it would be an event for them both and thrilling. Or it might be not the first time at all. In that case it will be a habit, and jolly. Anyhow, Evie said, Oh, go along and don't be a silly. Are you coming in tonight? He said, No, and laughed. Then they saw Alex turning into Violette. There now, said Evie, she must have seen you going on. Couldn't have missed it. Whatever will she think? She won't think anything, said Basil Doy. Alex is a nice person, and minds her own business. 
"'I believe it's her you're in love with, really,' said Evie, teasing him. He kissed her again and said, "'Oh, do you?' After a little more of the light conversation, which will easily be imagined, they parted. Evie went into Violette. She ran upstairs and into her dark bedroom and flung off her outdoor things. Turning, she saw Alex sitting on the edge of her bed. "'Goodness, how you startled me!' said Evie. "'Sorry,' said Alex. "'Got a toothache?' She was holding her face between her hands. Evie said, "'Oh, bad luck. Try some aspirin. Or suck a clove. I say, Al—' "'What? Did you see me and Mr. Doy just now in the road? You did, didn't you?' "'No,' said Alex. "'Oh,' said Evie, dubious, glancing at Alex's face that was dimly wan in the faint light from the street lamps, and twisted a little with her toothache. Pity seized Evie, who was kind. "'I say, Kiddy, do go to bed. What's the use of coming down with a face ache? You'd be much better tucked up snug with a clove poultice.' "'No,' said Alex uncertainly, and stood up. "'It's better now. I've put on cocaine. Where are my shoes?' "'Of course I saw you and Basil in the road. "'Did you have a jolly afternoon?' "'Evie knew that way of Alex's, "'of going back upon her lies. "'That was where Alex, as a liar, differed from herself. "'You only had to wait.' "'Yes, it was a lark,' said Evie carelessly. "'Mr. Doy's priceless, isn't he? "'Doesn't mind what he says, nor what he does, either. "'He makes me shriek, he's so comic. "'You should have heard him go on at tea.' "'We went to the rink, you know, and had tea there. "'He's so silly!' "'Ely laughed her attractive, gurgling laugh. "'They went down to supper. Two. "'Sometimes Basil and Evie lunched together. "'By habit they lunched in different shops "'and had different things to eat. "'Evie liked pea-soup or a poached egg, bread and honey, "'a large cup of coffee with milk.' and what she and the tea-shop young ladies called fancies. Basil didn't. When they lunched together, they both had the things Basil liked, except in coffee. "'Did you tell him two noirs?' Evie would say. "'Rubbish, you know I always have lay. "'A corrupt taste. "'One café au lait, waiter. "'You like the most ridiculous things, you know. "'You might be eight. "'You aren't grown up enough yet for black coffee, or smoking.' or liqueurs. You must meet my mother. You'd learn a lot from her. Oh, well, I'm happy in my own way. As for smoking, I think it's jolly bad for people's nerves, if you ask me. Alex smokes an awful lot, and her nerves are like fiddle-strings. I don't go so far, Evie said judicially, as to say I don't think it's good form for girls. That's what mother thinks, only, of course, she's old-fashioned. Very. So is Kate. "'But after all, there is a difference between men and girls in the things they should do. "'I think there's a difference, don't you?' "'Oh, thank goodness, yes,' said Basil fervently, not having always thought so. "'And I don't know, but I sometimes think if girls can't fight for their country, they shouldn't smoke.' "'Oh, I see. A reward for valour, you think it should be. "'That would be rather hard, since the red-tape rules of our army don't allow them to fight. "'If they might.' "'I've no doubt plenty would.' "'Evie laughed at him. "'A girl would hate it. "'She'd be hopeless.' "'Plenty of men hate it, and are hopeless, if you come to that.' "'Oh, it's not the same,' asserted Evie. "'A girl couldn't,' she added after a moment, sympathetically curious. "'Do you hate it much?' "'Oh, much,' Basil deprecated the adverb. "'It's quite interesting in some ways, you know.' he added, and at moments even exciting, though mostly a bit of a bore, of course, and sometimes pretty vile. But anyhow, seldom without its humours, which is the main thing. Oh, it's frightfully funny in parts. Anyhow, Evie explained for him, of course you're glad to be doing your bit. He laughed at that. You've been reading magazine stories. That's what the gallant young fellows say, isn't it? Look here. "'Bother the war. I want to talk about better things. "'Will you meet me after you get off this evening? 
I want a good long time with you, and leisure. These scraps are idiotic. Evie looked doubtful. You and me by ourselves? Or shall we get anyone else? Anyone else? What for? Spoil everything. Oh, I don't mind either way. Only Mother's rather particular in some ways, you know. And she... Well, if you want to know, she thinks I go out with you alone rather a lot. It's all rubbish, of course, as if one mightn't go out with who one likes. But, well, you know what Mother is. I told you, she's old-fashioned, a bit. And, of course, Kate's shocked. But I don't care a bit for Kate. She's too prim for anything. We won't care a bit for anyone, suggested Basil. I never do. I don't believe you do, really, either. If people are so particular... We must shock them, and have done. Anyhow, you don't suppose I'm going to give up seeing you? The quickening of his tone made her draw back from the subject. Evie liked flirtation, but did not understand passion. It was not in her cool head and heart. It was a thing in Basil that made her at times lately shy of him in their intercourse. Vaguely she realised that he might become unmanageable. She liked him to love her beauty, but she was occasionally startled by the way he loved it. She thought it was perhaps because he was an artist, or a soldier, or both. "'Well, perhaps I'll come,' she said to soothe him. "'Where shall we go? Let's go inside something, I say, not walking in the dark like last time. Oh, it was very jolly, of course, but it's not so snug and comfy. We might do a play.' I say, it's nearly two. I must get back. I got into a row yesterday for being late. That was your fault. They walked together to the side door of the select hat shop. Not really a shop, as Evie explained sometimes. More of a studio, it is. It's awfully artistic, our work. While she went upstairs, she was thinking. Dommage, he's getting so warm sometimes. It spoils the fun. He'll be wanting to tie me up if I'm not careful, and I'm not ready for that yet. There are plenty of others. I don't know. 3. As it happened, she met one of the others when she left the shop at five, and he took her out to tea at the most expensive tea place in London, which was always his way with tea and other things. He was on leave from France, and had met Evie for the first time three days ago, when she was out with Doy, whom he knew. His name was Hugh Montgomery Gordon, and he was the son of Sir Victor Gordon of Ellaby Hall in Kent, Prince's Mansions in Park Lane, and Gordon's Jam Factory in Hackney Wick. He was handsome in person, graceful, clear-featured, an old lawn tennis blue, and a young man with great possessions, who, having been told on good authority that he would find it hard to enter into the kingdom of heaven, had renounced any idea of this enterprise he might otherwise have had, and devoted himself wholeheartedly to appreciating this world. He was in a cavalry regiment, and had come through the war so far, cool, unruffled, unscathed, and mentioned in dispatches. He had a faculty for serenely expecting and acquiring the best in most departments of life, though in some, such as art, literature and social ethics, he failed through ignorance and indifference. Meeting Evie Tucker in Bond Street, and perceiving, as he had perceived before, that her beauty was in a high class of merit, he was stirred by desire to acquire her as a companion for tea, and did so. Evie liked him. He was really more in her line than Basil Doy. Artists were queer. There was no getting round that, even if they had given it up for soldiering and had lost interest in it and fingers. And she liked the place where they had tea and liked the tea and the cakes and the music and liked him to drive to Clapton with her in a taxi afterwards. You don't seem economical, do you? She remarked as they whirred swiftly eastward. "'I hope not,' said Hugh Montgomery Gordon, in his slow, level tones. "'I can't stand economical people.' He left her at Violette and drove back to his club, 
feeling satisfied with himself and her. She was certainly a find, though it was a pity one had to go so far out into the wilderness to return her where she belonged. Her people were, no doubt, what his sister Myrtle would call quite impos. 4. As Evie and Captain Gordon had taxied down Hoban, they had passed and been held up for a minute near Alex, Nicholas and West, who stood talking at the corner of Chancery Lane. "'Hugh Montgomery Gordon,' Nicholas murmured. "'Bright and beautiful as usual. "'Know him, Alex? "'Surely he doesn't visit at Violette. "'I can't picture it somehow.' "'Oh, he might, for Evie's sake. "'Evie picks them up, you know. "'It's remarkable how she picks them up. "'They look very beautiful together, don't they? "'Is he nice?' "'Just as you saw.' I scarcely know him more than that. He was a hall man, my year. I believe he had a good time there. He looks as if he had a good time still. West's opinion about him are more pronounced than mine. Is he nice, West? He's in the family jam, West told Alex, as sufficient answer. Gordon's jam, if that means anything to you. Wooden pips and sweated girls, Alex assented, having picked up these things from her mother. It must be exciting. So many improvements to be made. No doubt, agreed West. But the Gordons won't make them. They make jam and they make money, any amount of it. But they don't make improvements that won't pay. A bad business. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the Day of Judgment. At least I hope it will. They've been badgered and bullied about it by social workers for years. But they don't mind. And at the same time, of course, they've no more ideas about what to do with their money than, than Solomon had. They put it into peacocks and ivory apes. These rich people. Well, I should like to have the Gordons in a dungeon and pull out their teeth one by one as if they were Jews till they forked out their ill-gotten gains for worthy objects. If you ever meet Gordon, Miss Sandemir, you might tell him what I think about him. Tell him we have a meeting of the Anti-Sweating League in our parish room every Monday, and should be glad to see him there. Nicholas wondered, though he didn't ask Alex, whether Evie was still on with Basil Doy, or whether a breach there had made a gap by which Hugh Montgomery Gordon was entering in. One thought of Evie's friendships with men in these terms, whereas Alex might drive with a different man every day without suggesting to the onlooker that one was likely to oust another. The difference was less between Evie and Alex, for Evie was of a fine and wide companionableness, than in what men required of them respectively. Evie and he, Alex commented, considering, they might be good friends, I think. They might fit. The jam wouldn't get between them, nor the money. I rather like him too, I think. He's so beautiful and looks as if he'd never been ill. That's so jolly. She was giving the same reasons which Basil had given for liking Evie. It occurred to her to wonder whether, if she'd been to the war, these two things would take her further in her mild inclination towards Hugh Montgomery Garden. Much further. Perhaps they would. Alex went to her bus at the corner of Gray's Inn Road. Nicholas went back to his rooms to finish an article. West went to a sweated bookmaker's protest meeting in his parish room. West attended too many meetings, that was certain. Meetings, a clumsy contrivance at best, cannot be worth so much attendance. But he went off to this one full of faith and hope, as always. 5. Evie was using the telephone in the hall. She was saying in her clear, cheery tones... Hello, is that you? Awfully sorry. Don't expect me tomorrow evening. I can't come. Awfully sorry. Don't quite know. I'll write. Alex went up to her room. Presently Evie came in. Did you hear me phoning? She inquired superfluously. It was to Mr. Doy. Fact is, I think he and I'd both be better for a little rest from each other. It'll give him time to cool down a bit. He's got keener than I like lately. Fun's all very well, but one doesn't want to be hustled, does one? I don't want him asking me anything for a long time. 
Alex, sitting on her bed with one shoe off, pulling at the other, said in a small voice, "'I don't think he will.' Evie turned round and looked at her questioningly. "'You don't? Why, whatever do you know about it?' Alex was bent over her shoe. Her voice was muffled. "'Basil is like that. He doesn't mean things.' "'Oh!' Evie turned to the glass and drew four pins out of the roll of hair behind her head, and it fell in a heavy nut-brown mass, glinting in the yellow gaslight. She began to comb it out and roll it up again. "'Doesn't mean anything, doesn't he?' she said thoughtfully. "'You seem awfully sure about that.' "'Yes,' agreed Alex. She had pulled off both shoes now, and tucked her stockinged feet under her as she sat curled up on the bed. She drew a deep breath and spoke rather quickly. "'He's always the same. He was the same with me once. He doesn't really mean it.' "'The same with you?' Evie, without turning round, saw in the glass the blurred image of the huddled figure and small pale face in the shadows behind her. She drove in two more hairpins, then turned sharply and looked at Alex. "'You don't mean to say he used to be in love with you?' "'Oh, in love?' Alex's voice was faint, attenuated, remote. "'Well, anything, then,' Evie was impatient. "'You needn't split hairs. He went on with you, I suppose. And you—' She broke off, staring uncomfortably at a situation really beyond her powers. Her cogitations ended in— "'Well, I think you might have told me at first. "'I thought you and he were just good friends. "'I didn't want him. "'I wouldn't have let him come near me if I'd known it was like that. "'I never do that sort of thing. "'Now do I, Alex? "'You've never seen me mean to other girls like that, have you? "'I never have been, and I never will be. "'I don't want him. "'You can have him back.' "'Alex giggled suddenly, irrepressibly. "'What's the matter now?' said Evie. "'Nothing. Only the way you talk of Basil, handing him about as if he was a kitten. He's not, you know.' Evie smiled grudgingly. "'Well, anyhow, I don't want him, particularly if he doesn't mean anything, as you say. It isn't every one I'd believe if they told me that. They might be jealous or spiteful or something. But I don't believe you'd say it, Al, if you didn't think it was true.' Alex said, "'Oh!' on a soft, indrawn breath. "'And you know him, so I expect you're right. And I'm not going on playing round with a man who makes love like he does and doesn't mean anything. It isn't respectable.' "'Oh, respectable!' Alex laughed again shakily. It was such a funny word in this connection, and so like Violette. "'Well, I don't see it's funny,' said Evie. "'It's awfully important to be respectable, and I always am.' I'll be good pals with any number of men, but when they begin to get like Basil Doy, I won't have it unless they mean something. Thus Evie enunciated her code, and washed her hands and face, and put on her dress, and went downstairs. At the door she paused for a moment, and looked back at Alex. I say, Al, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't mean to be a sneak, you know. I wouldn't have, if I'd have known... "'Not a bit,' Alex absurdly and politely murmured. "'Well, do get a move on and come down. "'It's too cold for anything up here. "'I say,' Evie paused awkwardly, "'I say, Kitty, you didn't really care, did you?' "'Alex shook her head. "'Oh, no.' "'Still her voice was small, polite and attenuated. "'Well, then,' said Evie cheerfully, "'no harm's done to anyone.' But still, it's not the style I like. A man that plays about first with one girl, then another. I'm going down. She went. 6. The cold made Alex shiver. She stiffly uncurled herself and got off the bed. She brushed her hair before the glass. Her face looked back at her, pointed and ghostly, in the gaslight and shadows. "'Cad,' whispered Alex, without emotion, to the pale image. 
Cad and liar. It's the war, explained Alex presently, with detached, half-cynical analysis. I shouldn't have done that before the war. I suppose I might do anything now. Probably I shall. There seems no way out. Alex had heard and read plenty of views on the psychological effects of war. Some of them were interesting, some were true. Many were true for some people and false for others. But she did not remember that even the most penetrating or pessimistic had laid enough emphasis on the mental and moral collapse that shook the foundations of life for some people. For her, anyhow, and for Paul, and they surely could not be the only ones. Observers seemed more apt to take the cases of those men and women who were improved, who were strengthened, steadied, made more unselfish and purposeful, that was the favourite word, with a finer sense of the issues and responsibilities of life, or of those young sportsmen at the front who kept their jollity, their sweetness, their equilibrium through it all. Well, no doubt there were plenty of these, Look at Terry, look at Dorothy and Margot at Wood End, in their new strenuousness and ardours. They weren't demoralised by horror, or eaten by jealousy like a canker. They could even minister to combatants without envying them. There were such, there might be many. But Alex looked at them far off, herself a broken, nerve-racked, frightened child, grabbing at other people's things to comfort herself. "'ashamed but outrageous. "'There seems no way out,' said Alex, "'and looked, as she changed her frock, "'down vistas of degradation. "'Downstairs Florence rang the supper bell. "'The smell of Welsh rarebit drifted through Violette. "'That, anyhow, was something. "'Alex liked it. "'End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Alex and Basil. Evie had a good time for the rest of the week of Captain Gordon's leave. Mrs. Frampton began to wonder whether this enormously wealthy and overwhelmingly well dressed young man really meant anything. If you could tell anything by the size of the chocolate boxes he sent, he certainly meant quite a lot. Kate looked repressive when they arrived. "'How Evie does go on,' she said to Mrs. Frampton at breakfast, before Evie came down, referring to the immense box from Buzzards by Evie's plate. That was the morning after Hugh Montgomery Gordon had returned to his duties in France. Apparently, whatever else he meant, he meant not to be forgotten. "'She's a naughty girl,' Mrs. Frampton admitted indulgently. "'I shouldn't wonder if that's from this new friend of hers, Captain Gordon. "'He looks such an extravagant man, but very handsome. "'What does your brother think of Captain Gordon, Alex? "'Didn't you say he knew him?' "'Mrs. Frampton was of those ladies who believe that men, "'good judges in most matters,' are especially good judges of each other. Alex said she didn't believe Nicholas had thought about Captain Gordon at all. But his friend Mr. West has quite a lot, she added. Well, love, what does Mr. West think? Mr. West was even better than Nicholas as a source of knowledge, being not only a man but a clergyman. Mr. West, said Alex, thinks Captain Gordon too rich. It's a fad of Mr. West's that people shouldn't be too rich. I think they should. Well, we're told, aren't we, that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. A little more ham, Alex. It's all a question, said Kate, of the use people make of their wealth. They say that some of the wealthiest families in the land make the best landlords and are the kindest to all. I can't say I hold with socialism. It seems to me most wrong-headed. Well, Mrs. Frampton agreed, it certainly does seem like flying the face of what Providence has ordained, doesn't it? Let me see now, Alex. Your brother doesn't hold with socialism, does he? Alex's brother, being clever and queer, might hold with anything. 
Mrs. Frampton appeared to feel a morbid interest in his opinions. Nicky, he doesn't hold with anything, cousin Emily. He's a general disapprover. I believe he hates socialism. He thinks it makes for dullness and stagnation and order and all sorts of things he doesn't like. Mrs. Frampton said, Why, I should have thought what socialists wanted was quite an uprooting and an upset. And then Evie's entrance interrupted a discussion which might have been fruitful. Evie kissed her mother. She said, Whatever in the world are you talking about? Socialism? What a subject for breakfast. Buttered egg for me, please. Oh, chocks. She opened them, smiling, and looked at the card inside. He is extravagant, she said. This is an awfully special box. He must have ordered it from Buzzards before he went. I don't think you should permit it, said Kate primly. Oh, it's all right. He likes it. He's simply rolling. Evie was absorbed in the pencilled inscription on the card. Life was pleasant to Evie. Her mother smiled indulgently on her. Evie certainly did seem to have a lot of young men at once. But then how pretty the child was, and how she enjoyed it. And she had sense, too. Evie never lost her head. Evie opened the letter by her plate. She read it and laid it aside carelessly, and looked up. "'Yes, some ham, please. "'Mr. Doy writes he's seen the board again, "'and he's to join in a week. "'I suppose he's satisfied now.' "'Mrs. Frampton clicked deprecatingly with her tongue. "'She regarded it always as a matter for great regret "'that wounded young men should have to return to the wars. "'Well, I'm sorry for that. "'Anyone would think he'd done enough "'having lost a finger for his country. "'I call it shameful, sending him out again.' "'Perhaps he'll go to Serbia this time,' said Evie. "'He said there was a chance of his battalion getting sent there from France soon. "'Well, well, that seemed, if anything, more unreasonable still. "'I'm sure one's dreadfully sorry for poor Serbia. "'She does seem to be having a bad time, "'but I'm not sure that our men ought to be sent out to those parts. "'They're all so wild out there. "'It seems as if, in a way, they rather like fighting each other.' "'Anyhow, they've always been at it since I can remember, "'and I think they'd much better be left to fight it out among themselves "'while we defend poor France. "'But who are we to judge? "'I suppose Lord Kitchener knows what's right. "'They say,' put in Kate, "'that Joffre had a great to do before he would persuade Kitchener "'to send forces out there at all. "'They say he came to the war office "'and broke his riding whip right across. "'Fancy that!' He must be a very violent man. But the French are always excitable. Lord Kitchener's one of the quiet ones, I've heard. A regular Englishman. Well, I'm sure I hope they're taking the right course. Alex, you haven't had half a breakfast. I'm sure you can manage another bit of toast. Evie, dear, you'll have to hurry with your breakfast or you'll be late. Evie hurried. She spent the week with partial success in avoiding Basil Doy. Since she had done with him, what was the use of scenes? She certainly wasn't going to let him go away with the impression that he would find her waiting on his next return from the war to beguile his leave time. Her natural generosity forbade her to take and keep Alex's young man. Her natural prudence forbade her to philander too ardently, having a good time is different, of course, with a young man who probably didn't mean business. Rightly, Evie condemned these practices as not respectable. So she went off at lunchtime with other friends, with a little pang, indeed, but less acute than she would have felt a week ago, before her rapid friendship with Hugh Montgomery Gordon. Basil Doy was being relegated quickly to the circle of Evie's numerous have-beens, to be remembered with pleasant indifference. On the Saturday before he left London, Basil obtained an interview with Evie by means of going, at immense sacrifice of time, to Violette. It was a short interview, and not intimate, for Mrs. Frampton and Kate were present at it. After it, Basil called at Clifford's Inn to say good-bye to Nicholas and Alex, who, they told him, was there. 2. He found Alex alone, waiting for Nicholas to come in. 
She had been having tea and was reading Peacock Pie. She preferred this poetry to any written since August 1914, which had killed fairies. Looking up from it, she saw Basil standing at the door. He was flushed and looked cross. She knew of old the sulky set of his brows and mouth that made him look like a petulant boy. It hurt Alex so much that she couldn't muster any sort of smile, only look away from him and say, "'I'm sorry, Nick is not in yet.' He said, "'No,' abstractedly, and sat down in the chair on the other side of the fire. He sat in the attitude she had seen him in a thousand times, it seemed to her, before, his elbow resting on his knee, his hand supporting his chin, the other hand, with its maimed third and finger, hanging at his side. She had seen him sitting thus happy, intimately talking. She had seen him moody and brooding as now. There had been a time when she could always lighten these moods, tickle his sullenness to laughter, but that time was past. He said presently, "'I'm off tomorrow, you know.' "'Yes,' said Alex, who did know. In her another knowledge grew, the knowledge that if he did not speak of Evie she could get through this interview without disgrace, but that if he did speak of Evie she could not. She did not want him to speak of Evie and break down the wall between them, yet she did want it. He did speak of Evie. He said he had been to Violette to say good-bye. I said it to the whole family together. Evie wouldn't see me alone. I suppose she doesn't really care a hang. In fact, she's made that very obvious for the last fortnight. Yes, said Alex again, clinging to that one small word as to a raft in a stormy sea which might yet float her through. Basil pushed the tongs with his foot so that they made a clattering noise in the grate. She doesn't care a hang, he repeated. She's on with that jam fellow now. Well, everyone to his taste. Hugh Montgomery Gordon obviously appeals to her. Alex's hands were clasped tight over her knee. Her knuckles were white. She kept her eyes on the fire. She would not look at him. Yes, she said. Then silence fell between them, and though she would not look, she felt his nearness, knew how he sat, angry and sullen, brooding over his hurt. A coal fell from the fire. Alex, as if someone was physically forcing her, raised her eyes from it and looked at Basil, and knew then that she was not going to get through this interview without disgrace. For she saw him sit as she had seen him sit, it seemed to her, a thousand times before, inert, bent forward a little, with the shadows leaping and flickering on his thin olive face and vivid eyes, with one hand supporting his sharp-cut chin, the other hanging maimed, and that alone was something new, belonging to the cruel present, not the kindly past, at his side. It seemed that those lean, quick, brown artist's fingers were dragging her soul from her. The sharp sense of all those other times, when she and he had thus sat, stabbed her like a turning-knife. A thousand intimacies rose to shatter her, and, so shattered, she spoke. She doesn't care a hang. She repeated his phrase mechanically, sitting very still. But I do. Then she leant towards him, putting out her hands, and a sob caught in her throat. Oh, Basil, I do. For a moment the silence was only broken by the leaping, stirring fire. Basil looked swiftly at Alex, and Alex saw horror in his eyes before he veiled it. The next moment it was veiled, veiled by his quick, friendly smile. He leant forward and took her outstretched hands in his, and spoke lightly, easily. He did it well. Few people could have attained at once to such ease, such spontaneous naturalness of affection. Why, of course, I know. The way you and I care for each other is one of the best things I've got in my life. It lasts, too, when the other sorts of caring go fut. Yes, said Alex faintly. The raft of that small word drifted back to her, and she climbed onto it out of the engulfing sea. 
She took her hands from his and lay back in her chair, impassive and still. Basil rose and stood by the chimney-piece, playing with the things on it. He talked naturally, easily, of what he was going to do, the probabilities of his being sent out with a draft to France almost at once, the possibility of his battalion being sent to Serbia. He talked, too, of their common friends, even of painting, which he seldom mentioned now. Alex heard his voice as from a great distance off, and from time to time said, Yes. There was a sharp crack, and Basil held the stem of one of Nicholas's pipes in one hand, the bowl in the other. He had broken it in two. His fluent tongue, his flexible face, were under his control, but it seemed that his hands were not. They had shown thus blatantly the uncontrollable strain he felt. Alex winced away from it, she couldn't bear any more. He must go quickly before either of them broke anything else. He went, slipping as it were unnoticeably away, with goodbye, unemphasised, half ashamed, sandwiched between fatuities about the pipe and comments on the future. It was an ugly pipe, wasn't it? Tell Sandemir I broke it for his sake, compelled by my artistic conscience. It'll be for his good in the end. I'm sorry I've not seen him, but you'll say good-bye for me. And to any of them at the shop. Good-bye. If we do get out to the east, we shall have a funny time in some ways, I fancy. I hear Salonica's a great place, glorious Riviera climate, but less so inland. Too much snow on the hills. Well, it can't be worse than France in winter, anyhow. I believe the Bulgars are very good-natured people to fight against. They aren't really a bit keen on this show. Want to get back to till their fields. His voice came from beyond the door. Then it shut and muffled his steps running down wooden stairs. Alex let go her raft and was submerged by the cold, engulfing seas. End of chapter 12「Chapter thirteen of Non Combatants and Others by Rose Macaulay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Alex, Nicholas, and West. Nicholas, coming in ten minutes later, found Alex lying in his cane chair, limp and white and sick. My dear, he said after a glance, you seem very ill. You prescribe, and I'll see if West has any in his medicine cupboard. Sal volatile, perhaps, Alex murmured, and he went to find some. When he came back, she was sitting up, with a more pulled-together air. She sipped the sal volatile, and gave him a dim, crooked smile. It's my feelings, really, you know, not my body. It's only that I'm shocked to death. Nicholas stood short and square with his back to the fire, looking down on her with his small, keen, observant eyes. What shocked you? Me myself, said Alex, forcing an unconcerned grin. Alone I did it. What on earth's the matter, Alex? asked Nicholas after a pause. Or don't you want to talk about it? It wasn't his experience of his sister who he had always known of a certain exterior and cynical hardness, where the emotions were concerned, that she ever wanted to talk about it. But this evening she seemed queer, unlike herself, unstrung. "'Talking doesn't matter now,' said Alex, still swung between flippancy and tears. "'All the talking that matters is done already. "'Basil has gone away, Nicky. "'He'll perhaps never come back.' Oh, he will. Basil does. Nicholas looked away from her, down at the fire. Yes, said Alex. I expect he's sure to. I told him I cared for him, she went on in her clear, thin, indifferent voice, emptied of emotion. He doesn't care for me, you know. He pretended he hadn't understood. He pretended so hard that he broke your pipe. I was to tell you he was sorry about it. No, that he was glad, I think. Her voice changed suddenly, 
Anguish shook it. "'Can you make it any less bad, Nicky?' There was a pause while Nicholas, resting his arm on the chimney-piece, stared down into the fire. He and Alex, like many brothers and sisters, had always had a shyness about them, about intimate things. They were both naturally reserved, both fought shy of emotion as far as they could. They were, in some ways, very like. Despair had broken down Alex's reserve. Nicholas put his aside and considered her case in his detached way, as if it were a mathematical problem. Bad, he repeated, weighing the word. Well, the fact is bad, of course, that you care, and he doesn't. There's no altering that. It's his fault, of course, for caring himself once and leaving off. Well, anyhow, there it is. He's the poorer by it, not you. But the other part, you're telling him, isn't bad. It was merely the truth, and it's simpler and often more sensible to tell the truth about what one feels. I wouldn't mind that if I were you. Don't bring absurdities of sex etiquette into it. They're mere conventions, after all. Silly, petty, uncivilised conventions, aren't they? Perhaps, said Alex dully. I don't know. Well, I do. Telling the truth is all right. It oughtn't to make things worse. No said Alex. It does, you know. Nicholas, giving the subject the attention of his careful mind, knew it did. He couldn't theorise that away. Well, he said at last slowly, if it does, you might quite truly look at the whole thing as a mental case, a case of nervous breakdown. The war's playing the devil with your nerves. That's what it means. You do things and feel things and say things, I dare say, that you wouldn't have once, but that you can scarcely help now. You're only one of many, you know, one of thousands. The military hospitals are full of them, men who come through plucky and grinning, but with their nerves shattered to bits. There are the people, like Terry and plenty more, who come through mentally undamaged, their balance not apparently upset, and the people like John... "'at least I rather guessed so when I saw him, "'and thousands more who, well, who don't. "'War's such an insane, devilish thing. "'Its hoofs go stamping over the world, "'trampling and breaking. "'Oh, Lord, I've seen so much of it. "'It meets one all over the place. "'It makes one simply sick. "'This affair of yours is nothing to some things "'I've come upon lately. "'West says the same, you know.' Of course, as a parson, he sees much more of people in that way than I do. He says lots of the quite nice, decent women he visits have taken to getting drunk at the pubs. Partly they're better off than they were, of course, but it's mostly just nerves. You don't drink at pubs, do you? Not come to it yet, said Alex. Well, you're lucky. I consider you're jolly lucky, considering the state you've been in for some time, to have done nothing worse yet than to have told a man you've every right to care for that you care for him. Alex was crying now quietly. And I've done worse things too. I tried to get him back from Evie. I told her he didn't really care for her, that he had been just the same with me. Oh, I know he did care for me a little, of course, but... She choked on a laugh. He didn't behave as he does with Evie a bit. Probably not. "'Nicholas admitted. "'Well, there you are. "'I behaved like a cad about it. "'That's worse than drinking at pubs, much worse. "'It's even worse than telling him I cared. "'What can I do about it, Nicky? "'Is that part of the war disease, too?' "'Certainly,' said Nicholas promptly. "'Precisely the same thing, and bears out all I was saying. "'And as you remark... "'Much worse than drinking at pubs. "'Sorry, but it does prove my case, you know. "'You don't do that sort of thing in peacetime, at least, do you?' "'He added with impartial curiosity. "'I've forgotten about peacetime. "'No, I don't think I used to. "'Suppose I shall have to tell Evie,' "'Alex added morosely. "'Though she doesn't care for him a bit. "'What a bore! "'All right, Nicky.' I'll try to look at myself as a mental case, and what's left is that Basil has gone. 
I love him, you know, extraordinarily. I... Oh, Nicky, I love him, I love him, I love him. She passionately sobbed for a time. Nicholas stood silent, thinking, till she lay back exhausted and quiet. I'm sorry, she said huskily. I won't cry any more. That's all. Nicholas was looking at her consideringly. I wonder, he murmured, what the best remedy for you is. Something that takes your whole thoughts, I fancy, you want. Of course, there's a school, but it doesn't seem altogether to work. Some strong counter-interest to the war you want. To take me outside myself, Alex amplified for him. Perhaps you'd like me to collect bus tickets or lost cats or something to distract my mind, Nicky dear. I think not. Your mind, I should say, is distracted enough already. You need to collect that rather than bus tickets or cats. To me it seems a pity you should live at Violette. I think you should stop that. Alex said apathetically, I don't think it much matters where I live. I can't live at Wood End. It's all war and war work there, and I should go mad, even madder than now. I might drink at pubs. I thought Violette would be a rest, because they none of them care about the war really a bit. But it isn't a rest any more. Ever since Paul. I've known one can't really put the war away out of one's mind. It can't be done. It's hurting too many people too badly. It's no use trying to pretend it isn't there and go on as usual. I can't. I can't even paint decently. My work's simply gone to pot. Sure to, Nicholas agreed. I believe, said Alex, it's jealousy that's demoralising me most. Jealousy of the people who can be in the beastly thing. Oh, I do so want to go and fight. How can you not try to go, Nicky? I can't understand that. Though, of course, you wouldn't get past. It's quite easy, returned Nicholas. I don't approve of joining in such things. But I want to go and help to end it. Oh, it's rotten not being able to. Simply rotten. Why shouldn't girls? I can't bear the sight of khaki, and I don't know whether it's most because the war's so beastly or because I want to be in it. It's both. Oh, bother! Why were we born at a time like this, as Kate calls it? We weren't. The late eighties and early nineties were very different. They probably unfitted us for the Sturm und Drang of the twentieth century. Though if you come to that, there was plenty of Sturm und Drang in our own country at that period, as usual. I suppose Poles have no right to look for peace. Oh, Lord, how good it would be to see Germany and Russia exterminate each other altogether. I believe I'd cheat my way into the army and fight if I thought I could help in that. I dare say we shall see it, if this war goes on much longer. I've been wondering lately, went on Alex, if there isn't a third way in wartime. Not throwing oneself into it and doing jobs for it in the way that suits lots of people. I simply can't do that. And not going on as usual and pretending it's not there, because that doesn't work. Something against war I want to be doing, I think. Something to fight it and prevent it coming again. I suppose Mother thinks she's doing that. She does, said Nicholas. Undoubtedly. I'm not sure I agree with her, but that's a detail. She thinks she's doing it. Well, I gather she'll be home very soon now. And I suppose Mr. West thinks he's doing it, doesn't he? Fighting war, I mean, with his church and things. Yes, West thinks so too. Again, I don't particularly agree with his methods, but that's his aim. You don't particularly agree with any methods, do you? No, I think they're mostly pretty rotten. And in this case, I believe, personally, we're up against a hopeless proposition. West calls it the devil, and is bound by his profession to believe it will be eventually overcome. I'm not bound to believe that any evil or lunacy will be overcome. It seems to me at least an open question. Some have been, of course. Others have scarcely lessened in the course of these several million years. However, as West remarks, the world, no doubt, is still young. One should give it time. Anyhow, one has to. No other course is open to us, however poor a use we may think it puts the gift to. That's West, I think. Hello, West. We've been talking about you. 
We were discussing your incurable optimism. 2. West looked tired. He shook hands with Alex and sat down by the window. Alex did not feel it mattered that he should see she had been crying, because clergymen, who visit the unfortunate, the ill-bred, the unrestrained, must every day see so many people who have been crying that they would scarcely notice. Incurable, West repeated, and the crisp edge of his voice was flattened and dulled by fatigue. Well, I hope it is. There are moments when one sees a possible cure looming in the distance. I was saying, said Nicholas, that you are bound by your profession to believe in the final vanquishing of the devil. I believe I am, West assented without joy. I believe so. He cogitated over it for a moment and added, But the devil's almost too stupid to be vanquished. He's an animal, a great brainless beast, stalking through chaos. He's got a hide like a rhinoceros and a mind like an escaped idiot. You don't know where to have him. He drags people into his den and sits on them. It's too beastly. He wallows in his native mud, full of appetites and idiot dreams, and his idiot dreams become fact, and people make wars and get drunk. There are men and women and babies tight all about the streets this evening, Saturday night, you know. Sorry to be depressing, he added, more in his usual alert manner. It's a rotten thing to be in these days. The fog's bad outside. Alex rose to go, and West stood up too. For a moment the three stood looking at each other, in the fog-blurred, firelit room, dubious, questioning, grave, like three travellers who have lost their way in a strange country and are groping after paths in the dark. Nicholas spoke first. "'That's your bell, isn't it, West? You two could walk together as far as Grey's Inn Road.' Nicholas lit the gas and settled down to write. Alex and West went down the stairs and out into Fleet Street, and the city in the fog was as black as wood at night. 3. Alex thought, Christians must mind, clergymen must mind awfully. It's their business that's being spoilt. It's their job to make the world better. They must mind a lot, and they can't fight either and saw West's face tired and preoccupied in the darkness at her side. "'War extra! Fischl! Bulgarian advance! Fall of Kragievats!' cried a newsboy as best he could. "'It'll be all up with Serbia presently,' said West. "'Going under fast. A wipe-out like Belgium, I suppose. And we look at it from here and can't do anything to stop it. Pretty rotten, isn't it?' His voice was bitter. If we could go out there and try, said Alex, we shouldn't feel so bad, should we? He shook his head. No, not so bad. War's beastly and abominable to the fighters, but not to be fighting is much more embittering and demoralising, I believe. Probably largely because one has more time to think. To have one's friends in danger and not to be in danger oneself, it fills one with futile rage. Combatants are to be pitied, but non-combatants are of all men and women the most miserable. Older men, crocks, parsons, women, God help them. Yes, Alex agreed on the edge of tears again. Then West seemed to pull himself up from his despondency. But really, of course, they have a unique opportunity. They can't be fighting war abroad, but they can be fighting it at home. That's what it's up to us all to do now, I'm firmly convinced, by whatever means we each have at our command. We've all of us some. We've got to use them. The fighting men out there can't. They're tied. Some of them never can again. It's up to us. Goodbye, Miss Sandermere. My way is along there. They parted at the corner of Grey's Inn Road. Alex saw him swallowed up in black fog, called by his bell, going to his church to fight war by the means he had at his command. She got into her bus and went towards Violette, where no one fought anything at all, but where supper waited, and Mrs. Frampton was anxious lest she should have got lost in the fog. 
End of chapter 13. End of part 2.